Also, uh, good afternoon, uh, or still good morning, isn't it? <laughs> uh, my name is Drew Braden. I'm the Director of Tech Operations for Align Tech. Uh, we're an MSP, uh, managed service provider out of Birmingham, Alabama. Um, we are uh, corporate divisions of Lions and Company Incorporated. Uh, we're the uh, managed IT services arm of Lions HR. Um, they, they offer uh, full-scale outsourced uh, HR services, uh, as well as uh, another division, which is Aligned Insurance. You may have heard them speak before as well. Uh, they offer full-scale business and personal insurance products. Um, you know, today I, I want to talk about uh, some of the trends and some of the things that we've seen as, as an MSP through management systems, uh, MFA best practices, cloud-based software best practices, data retention best practices. But also, you know, I wanted this to be uh, as engaging as you like it to be as well, because I, I want you to get something out of this today that you can take back to your business. Um, you know, as an MSP, uh, we take our businesses seriously that we service. Um, we offer a great, uh, a great products that are that are well-rounded and that that do specific jobs to protect them uh, in a lot of ways. And and you know, we we want you to know that we can possibly do that for you as well. Um, so the statistics, uh, and that is all right. Okay. <laughs> so uh, some of the statistics that uh, we've gotten from, from Verizon uh, data breach investigations, and this is from 2021, so that data can change. Uh, I've, I've got some uh, new updated statistics that we can go through as well. Uh, but from then, 43% of all security breaches involve small to mid-sized businesses. 61% uh, of all uh, small and mid-sized businesses had a cybersecurity incident in the last year. And 83% of organizations in the small to mid-sized category are not financially ready to recover from cyber attacks. Uh, and why, why is that? Uh, well, there's, there's, a, there's a few reasons. One. The reason why they weren't prepared is because they're, if they had an issue with backups, uh, did they get those backups encrypted in that process? Where were their backups? Who was monitoring their backups? Um, why, why is that important? Well, if I don't have any data, right, then I can't see the patients or, or you know, do the job that I have because I don't have anything. Um, from, from our perspective, uh, as an MSP, uh, I, we come from a lot of the, uh, a lot of our clients are healthcare based. So data retention, uh, patient, keeping patient information, having those records, they have to have them for a specific amount of time. So that matters to yeah. us. So we try to make sure we're, we're building in our retention policies to reflect that. Um, the, the, the cost of, of not being able to, to see patients or do your job means that you can't make money, right? Your bottom line's affected. What does that mean? Well, if you can't recover, or you're not making money. That means you're losing money, right? That that will speak to the 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 business owner, right? If I can't make money, I'm losing money because I'm paying my employees to 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 work there. So a lot of that, and not only that, you could also be paying. Uh, you know, there there are um, insurance you know uh, uh, plans that you have out there where at one point. Right, that has now changed as we start working with insurance organizations. The, there was a swing in that pendulum where they would create those plans, not really having a plan in place to cover some of those issues that come up, whether it's a ransomware attempt or some type of data breach. But now they're creating more plans that have or require, there's a requirement for you to have things in place in order for them to actually cover you should these events happen, all right? So you may have started seeing that more in, uh, if you're going for cyber insurance, cyber liability insurance, the different plans that are out there, they've continued to go up um, because of the, the risk factor that's involved. And they're looking for things for you to have in place. So in, in the event they have to cover something, there is coverage for you. Um, yes, yeah, so just talk about some of the trends in, in um, security management. One of the things that we're seeing a lot more of, especially both in the threat landscape as well as 
the, um, the tools that we use to help protect you is uh, artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning. The problem that we've seen really over the last few years is that organizations are usually reactive they are waiting on their antiviruses to find these issues that are there rather than the proactive side, meaning they're actually looking for those threats and those trends. All right, we're seeing that a lot more uh, as far as the tools and offers, offerings that are out there um, on the EDR side. Adoption of zero trust, basically trusting no one. If I don't know who you are, I don't know what you're doing for me, I'm not allowing you to do anything on my in my network on my, uh, for my organization until that gets approved. Uh, and again, that's gonna be important, especially moving forward because the, the tools and the threats that are out there are becoming more and more aware of how to get around those, those um, tools that you have in place, those walls where previous antivirus uh, software may have worked better. We're seeing that to be not as effective. So. Um, true or false, we have a copy of an antivirus software that came on our computers. I download updates every time I get an affection, a notification, so we're protected. Yeah, so I would say no. Um, there, uh, one, for me, uh, I wouldn't want you to, to get those updates. For me, if I was your, your uh, MSP, I'd be doing them for you. Uh, they'd be doing it regularly. The threats constantly change. I wouldn't want you to have to do anything. The notifications that you get, you know, we would be getting them as well from a, if something happened, something occurred, so that we'd be proactive on that. Um, so, so yeah, and, and one of the tools we'll talk about a little bit more in that process is endpoint detection and response. And that's a new term to know. Um, you'll see that if you're filling out any type of cyber insurance uh, um, application, that's, that's a term you'll see. They're looking for that um, because these tools have advanced level uh, learning um, and they're, they're, they're adapting to the new threats that are out there in the landscape. And they're also, uh, they're, they log more information for you in case an event comes up. Um, one of the ones that we use also has built-in processes that do rollback. And I'll talk about that a little bit. So prevention, continuous updates, it's policy driven. It means we set up a policy to, you know, as far as not necessarily updates, but just things that we're looking for, um, things that we're trying to help protect from your standpoint, whether it's what we call whitelisting or approved processes that should work. <coughs> Analysis of malicious activities, uh, file-based and signature-less uh, malware, which we're seeing a lot more. Um, and then kill quarantine, remediation, and rollback endpoints. This is very important because uh, rollback endpoint processing can take, you know, if you have that in place, even though you got good backups, backups can take some time to restore from. Uh, endpoint detection and response takes seconds. So, you know, if it catches that and it's, it's on top of that particular issue, uh, I've seen it happen where um, a ransomware attempt occurred it caught that ransomware attempt, saw all the logs of the things that it changed, rolled it, rolled it back, and told us all the information as, as to what it changed uh, and, and what they did to prevent it. So that way you have an incident and you have auditing for the response uh, of, 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 of the tool that fixed the problem. So those things are getting smarter. Uh, it's things I have to think about, obviously, as, a, as an MSP. <laughs> uh, I want to say it keeps me up at night. EDR helps me sleep. <laughs> so, um, so we talk about, you know, just when, I, when I was talking about accelerate the threat investigation, like I said, it helps uh, MSPs and IT departments prevent and detect, quickly respond to ever-changing cyber threats. Now we're, we're kind of going to get into what, uh, once we get through some of these uh, true or false questions, uh, we, don't, we don't store employee information on our personal computer, so employee identity theft isn't impossible on our system. Well, you might not think you do. Um, I know a lot of people use Google Chrome. 
I know you probably save data in Google Chrome. Is it possible to get information off of that? It is, it is. Um, we actually uh, run a, um, a tool with one of our partners that does a, 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 you know, a testing process, asks you to download a link, click on that link and it'll run a scan uh, just that quickly on your workstation and your overall network. And they're, they're gonna find things. Uh, and it's only to help you because hackers aren't gonna help you with that, right? Uh, as I was uh, telling my colleagues earlier today, um, hackers only have to get it right some of the time. I have to get it right every time. So, and as a business, we want you to feel like you're confident that we can do the same thing for you. Uh, zero trust uh, security models, uh, assuming <laughs> everything in the network is untrusted and must be verified and authenticated before it can access resources. The way we used to do that primarily was, and we still use it to a, to a degree, um, you have a network, you have a domain, I have a domain controller that controls the things on my domain, and then it tells those devices on that domain what it can and cannot do. So I'm managing it that way. However, <coughs> there have been continual processes or in some ways, back doors or loopholes that have gotten through those processes that don't require that. There are tools out there, uh, and it's, it's funny when you go through some of these uh, security conferences that you learn some of the newer ways that they do that, and it's very interesting how they can use uh, a, a tool that's built into to Microsoft's native software that it then starts pulling a command from their software, well, let's say it's Word or um, QuickBooks, and it starts running programs from the native software to do things that it wasn't designed to do. And that's another way they're trying to get in, the, you know, hackers and, and uh, we'll just call them cyber terrorists. Are able, they're, they're trying to affect your day-to-day your -day business but in order to get to either the data that they're looking for or to prevent you from getting access to your data. And Zero Trust helps prevent that because it creates a process at which where you use tools that prevent those things from happening. Um, one of the tools that we, we use specifically is called Threat Locker. Um, it, it limits what each software does. It puts a ring around it as it's called and limits what access it actually is supposed to do, learns what the program is designed to do and make sure it stays in its lane. Um, Multi-factor authentication, you know, we're seeing a, a definite increase uh, in the need for that. We as an MSP have now required it. Um, most uh, other vendors and organizations are following suit. Um, if, you, if you would do any research for Microsoft, they'll tell you that 80% of all uh, hacks and, and, and issues with your, with your login getting hacked can be solved by 80% uh, by just adding a basic MFA, whether it's a texting or call, um, and with an actual MFA tool, like an authenticator, which is free, you can download it uh, from the App Store, Android or, or Apple OS. Either one will have it, it's free. Uh, and that takes it to 99%. Uh, MFA is, you know, you know your password and you have a tool to authenticate. Um, and that's really important. I recommend everybody have it. It used to be where that, you, that was a, a problem in regards to the complexity and the ability to understand how that worked. And we're really past that. I think everybody can understand how MFA works and why it's needed. So, uh, and if you don't, well, if you get hacked one time, you'll, you'll, you'll learn like that, that that why it's important because it, it can happen. And a lot of times it's not a happen as a, as a question as a, if it's a, it's a win, but if you have those things in place, you can prevent it. So MFA, um, as we talked about, uh, MFA we require for all users. It's a combination of, of factors, which is a password and a token or a biometric. Um, they also, uh, depending on the organization and what you're part of, you might have a single sign-on solution, um, whether it's a hospital's a lot of times require it, whether it's a, a barcode or some type of scanner. 
uh, or, or a, um, a fingerprint, depending on um, your level of uh, sophistication. Um, we also look at you know, risk-based authentic authentication, uh, remote versus on-site employees, why that's important, what kind of access do they need, and just trying to understand the factors in that side. Um, making sure that we're keeping those MFA factors separate, uh, make sure you're not using the same device for both password and token-based. Um, you know, use the time limit authentication. Um, if you can provide yourself alternative authentication methods, that, that's also helpful. Um, so you're not locking yourself out. Um, because there are programs that are out there that if you don't remember your password, that, that's it. Like, you know, there's not a, a way to fix that. Um, uh, especially with our, our, and that's why it's important uh, within that process to have a, a path, password management tool that you use. Uh, so that you can help uh, yourself not have to keep up with so many. Um, I think the reason why you start seeing a lot of the same passwords that you use over and over and over again is because you don't want to have to remember 50 different ones. Well, if you create a, a password management tool that you only have to remember one, then you can use that, authenticate to that, and that way it'll start pulling in that information for you. Um, we offer tools and services that allow for our clients to have that as an option. And um, we're, we're seeing them see positive results out of it. Because if you don't, I mean, <laughs> it, it's funny, we, and I talked about that, that pen test uh, link earlier about you know, them trying to find passwords and things of that nature. And it, it was funny, because they, they'll show you the, the results of that and how many different passwords that they're, although they have them kind of redacted, you can see the same one people have used on a consistent basis. And usually what happens, you change one character, right? Uh, an, an at symbol or an exclamation point or one, and you're up to probably now seven because you've done it so many times and you required every 90 days. I am really tired of changing this password. I don't want to have to remember another. And that, that uh, solution would help you with that. Uh, Cloud-based software best practices. You know, with, with authentication, uh, and, and access controls that are a lot of times there's built into the software so they already kind of have you on a level a, a, a password what we call a rotation uh, process meaning it's going to require you to change it every so often which again is not as difficult if you're having to change it to some random characters which I think is is better if you have it built into some type of tool so that way you don't have to remember it specifically um, you know, a lot of, for us, those, those password uh, management tools can be built into your browser. So it's already there for you to access it, and it just easily puts it in for you. Now, why do I want, not want to use Chrome? Well, how is it encrypted inside of Chrome? Who's encrypting it? Are you linking it to some account? Or are you just having it saved as your, part of your bookmarks? There's questions you need to ask yourself there because you want to be able to protect yourself. And the best way to do that is have the education of what could be a potential issue. Uh, you know, implement data encryption. A lot of times, uh, that, from a software-based perspective, that's going to be on the vendor. Uh, if you're the decision maker in, in your practice, knowing how they do that, how they back up your data, uh, is your right. Uh, you can ask them for that information. Uh, and they should be able to provide you some a process on how they do it, um, where it's stored, maybe how many different locations that it's stored to help protect you. Plus, for you as the, as the business owner, the other thing that we try to help with in some cases is the, um, we don't necessarily do the employee handbook, but we'll try to be side by side with you on some of the IT requirements. And having that information for you is great for your disaster recovery plan. Uh, as we talk about to implement uh, data backup and disaster recovery. Um, some of the terms that we try to go over at least more in depth when we're talking about data backup and disaster recovery is RPO, recovery point objectives. Like how long can you be down? You know, recoverable timeline. Um, and then in some cases, I think the more difficult part uh, for, 
for businesses is to be able to schedule time to actually run through that process, actually go through a mock disaster recovery process because it requires time. It requires uh, you to, to stop your general day-to-day -day activities and go through that process. But the benefits is you now know what to expect should you go through that event. In some cases, it's just if the internet goes down and I'm cloud-based, well, what do I do? Yeah, what, what do you do, right? Because if you're, you depend on the internet to provide you um, the tools that you need, you, know, you need to be able to have a plan on, okay, how long am I down? Like, what is my next process if it's down for over an hour? What am I doing then? Just having those processes built in, not just for you, but for your employees, because you want them to also be effective and you don't want them to be sitting there, <laughs> right? Um, so you know, th those, those processes, those, those things to keep in mind as you're building out that plan. Uh, data retention, best practices, and recommended policies. Uh, we'll, I want to go through that just, just briefly on kind of what we recommend. Um, and, but uh, and that'll lead into one of the other things we talk about from a cloud-based perspective. My company uses Office 365. We store everything on the cloud. I don't need to back up my data because it's already stored in the cloud. Who backs up Office 365? Thank you, Heather. Um, Microsoft doesn't back up Office 365. When it's in the cloud, it's, I mean, that's where it is. So if something happens to your data in the cloud, then it's messed up. Right, if, if the actual root file, I'm not talking about your workstation, if something happens to your workstation, that's different. But if you're, if you're uh, if for some reason, your computer or somebody that uses the same SharePoint folder or, or is linked to a specific uh, folder that everybody else accesses and that gets encrypted, like you have a harder time of trying to recover that. Um, we have tools um, that are out there that, that help recover Office 365 and SharePoint data that it's backing up on a regular basis. We typically do uh, um, backups hourly uh, and then we compile them up to a, a daily and then a weekly and then a, and then a, a monthly. Uh, but the tools that we have out there don't require as much consolidation as they used to. But, uh, you know, retention processes and understanding who is doing what is very important. Uh, cloud security, cloud first backup, disaster recovery, archiving for physical servers. Um, you know, if, if you have, so, so in general, the, the processes for us when we're doing backups is, we have on-site and off-site backups. Uh, that's important because on-sites obviously can get you up quicker because the data is, re the restoration process for on-sites is faster. But, um, you know, the, the, the sophistication of ransomware and uh, how they attack the overall landscape of, of your network, um, you, you see more and more uh, concerns with just on-site backups. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you've watched any of the, in the recent hospital shows, but I feel like every, every month there was one that came out with some random, um, rans we got a ransomware attack, and then she'd be sitting in, or somebody would be sitting in a, a dimly lit, lit server room and just like, oh, I got to fix this issue. And I'm thinking, that's not how this works. Like, this, this is not how this, this works. Uh, and then you have the insurance guy come in and say, well, we'll be willing to pay this. And you know, I'm like, no, no, there's much more specific process and it doesn't involve just one person, but okay, a uh, big hospital, uh, that seems a bit over dramatic. but it is a show, so I get that. But at the same time, you know, it, having a structured process in place is very important. For us, what we recommend, obviously we have on-site and off-site backups. They back up every hour on the hour. Um, you know, we can check if you have a specific retention policy, we would set that up to where we would have specific data from not just a month ago, but from a year ago. Um, that doesn't mean that most up to date data doesn't have that information, but if there are changes, say something that you deleted or what have you, then we can have that as an option 
for you as well. Um, it's, it's affordable. Um, I don't want you to think that data backups is you know, really going to break the bank, but at the same time, it should be a priority for all organizations. Um, knowing what's backed up, where it's backed up, how, all those things as a, as a business owner or a decision maker is important for you. Um, what the other things too, as far as um, security, we talk about affordability. You know, a lot of the times for us, there isn't really specific hardware requirements as there used to be. Um, I, I remember starting with tape backups and having to take tape backups to the local bank and putting them into uh, their safe deposit box. Um, I, before I, I was working for an MSP, uh, I worked for an academic organization, and that's one of the ways they did those backups, tape backups, which is so antiquated now. It's just a funny process to think about. Uh, how far we've come with that process, but we've had to because we've had to, we've seen the responses of how ransomware affects things and how quickly we need to restore and the tools that are needed in order to restore that data. Uh, so we put an emphasis on privacy and data protection. One of the things too that that I'll try to go through this, but also kind of talk about. One of the the statistics we talked about was was. Um, ransomware, but how is it coming in? Um, and, and why we're putting an embassy on privacy and data protection is because we're starting to see, I mean, there's always been a, a, a high number for it to come through email. And I think things are starting to change a little bit in some of those regards. But it's funny because I, I started looking through how much spam people get on a daily basis. And uh, in 2023, or 2022, I should say, overall, 48% of all emails were spam. Um, 3.4 billion spam emails are sent every day. That's a lot. <laughs> and for and uh, and we were talking about that. They're becoming more and more um, believable, and they're they're getting through because of what what they're they're the the filters are looking for. Um, and uh, the other things that, that, that's becoming more difficult to stop because it's using random numbers is spoof texting. Getting messages from people saying, hey, I need you to go to the store and get these gift cards and I need you to email me this information. Thanks, and then have like their name. You got any of those before? Uh, we got one last week from our, our founder. <laughs> it was just, you know, how do you stop that? Well, it's not our number. It's a random number. So for us to prevent those type of things becoming more difficult, that's why it's important to have education in place for your end users to know what to look for. Um, the adage that you're only as strong as your weakest link is very, very true, especially if they click on that link. Um, so... Um, uh, this specific uh, statistics came from UK, but 83% of UK businesses that suffered a cybersecurity attack in 2022 reported the type of attack as phishing. Um, so you'll see in coming a, a lot of that coming through that 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 way, and I think it's important not that you have a good email filter because that's obviously uh, important, but your your staff knows what to look for and providing the training so that they can know to look for that. Um, one of the things that I see all the time, uh, especially from the Lions IT side, is there. This is a this is a partnership with your IT. Like we're we're doing everything we can, but we also re rely on your communication on saying, this is what I received. This is what it looks like, because the tools that we're using are ever learning. Right? They're always trying to adapt to those changes. And that feedback from you is really helpful. Um, let's see here. So yeah, this kind of goes through some of the things that I wanted to go through. What, what questions can I answer for you? 